Okay, it's fantastic to be able to be here today. Thanks, Jeremy, for inviting me. And it's fantastic also to be able to see some old friends and catch up with some people too. Um, hopefully I'll get a chance to chat with a few more of you um, later as well. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some work that we've been doing in my group, um, trying to um, improve or to enhance the efficacy of our spear T-cell product by what we call next generation approaches. So our legal team have requested that I put this slide on. We're a, we're a public company, so with all the various um, restrictions and so on that come as part of being part of that, we're listed on the NASDAQ. Um, so what I want to just start off by saying is we're different from, uh, we're, we're a TCR based company. Um, so it's different from a car T cells, presumably all of you heard about car T cells. So what we do is essentially we engineer the T cell receptor rather than um, the car T, rather than the car, express it in the, t the patient's T cells. We engineer it such that it recognizes um, tumor antigens with a higher affinity. And essentially what we're trying to do is to use the T cell's own signaling machinery. So a T cell is designed to have a TCR um, doing the signaling cascade. And so it's different from a car in that it, it it, we, we use the T cell's own signaling machinery for activating the T cell. The other, uh, one of the other fundamental differences between a TCR and a car is that the TCR re will recognize um, peptides pr processed and presented on the cell surface, whereas a car obviously will only recognize cell surface bound proteins. So there are a different array of targets that might be, pr might, might be tractable for a TCR therapy versus a car therapy. So this is a, an example of some of the affinity enhancement process we, we undergo. So the essential point to take home is that most natural affinity tumor specific TCRs don't work very well. Um, they typically recognize tumor antigens with low affinity um, and therefore we don't, the, the T cells don't react particularly well in the context of cancer. And what we do as a company is we, we um, use a process of affinity maturation to enhance the, avidity of the, TC, uh, of the affinity of the TCR such that it enhances the avidity of the functional T cells and enhances recognition of the, um, of the targets. We have a number of um, uh, TCRs that are currently in uh, clinical trials at the moment. So we've got three TCRs, one for MAJ10, which is a uh, multi-cancer, uh, well, two different, ca uh, two different trials ongoing, one in non-small cell, bladder melanoma, head and neck, a large basket study on different indications with the MAJ4, and uh, AFP and hepatocellular carcinoma. So those are at different stages of the uh, trial at the moment. So that's not really my area. <laughs> so I'm going to sort of take you now on to the sort of fundamental research that we've been doing as part of my group, um, which is around next generation T cells. So as I probably don't need to labor the point to you, tumors are incredibly messy, incredi incredibly immunologically complex environments for a T cell to function in. Under normal circumstances, as on the left-hand side, you can get recognition of a tumor antigen and eradication of the tumor, and it all works beautifully and well. Um, however, as time goes by, um, immune escape variants can occur, and you can get immune escape, and this is via a number of different mechanisms, upregulation of immunoregulatory enzymes, such as IDO or arginase. It can be through recruitment of um, immunoregulatory cell populations, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, um, macrophages, regulatory T cells, all of which have a really a deleterious effect on the immune response, con which controls the immune response and allows the tumor to escape. So it creates an essentially a very hostile environment in which the immune system uh, doesn't function particularly well. So if you have been to any IO conference, probably in the past 10 years or so, well, not quite 10 years, uh, probably seven or eight years, you'll have seen a figure like this somewhere at some point in a poster or a talk. It's from a review by Ira Melman. And this is essentially what's, indicate, what's called the, tumor, the, the cancer immunity cycle. And it indicates the various points at which the immune system interacts with cancer at different stages. So what we're trying to do in Adaptamine with our first generation products is, it's not showing the, I'll put the pointer up. Okay, I'll is over here on the right hand side where we've got the, uh, we're trying to enhance the recognition of the tumor antigen by the T cell. But you can see there are many other places within the tumor immunity cycle in which one could also interact to um, enhance the efficacy of an immune response. And indeed many different companies, many different um, academic labs are trying different strategies with which to enhance the immune response against cancer at different points within this Im immune cycle. 
So what we're trying to do as a group as part of our next generation strategy is to try and to think of other ways in addition to enhancing the TCR affinity by which we may be able to enhance the efficacy of our product. And broadly, these fall into four main buckets. So the first is to overcome that hostile tumour microenvironment that causes problems for T-cells to function. Another way is to enhance the persistence of our T-cells within the patients. The third bucket is a, is a more, slightly more, uh, inducing a, a broader immune response in whatever, that way may, in whatever way that may take. And that's typically to bring in other arms of the immune system to be, so they're functional. So you're not just relying on one thing, but you're bringing in different components of the immune system to function. And then this other one, which is slightly vague, which is in improving T cell functions in whatever way. So I'm going to tell you two brief stories, uh, a, various, uh, a couple of projects we've been doing. This is all data that um, we have been working on together with our colleagues at GSK. We've had a partnership with them for a number of years. So this is the, f the first one is um, co-expression of the CD8 molecule, particularly to enhance the activity of the CD4 component of our product. Now this is Immunology 101, so I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to labour the point too much, but obviously we're expressing within our product a T-cell receptor that recognises a class 1 molecule. Now in the context of the CD8 T-cell, that's fine, the CD8 co-receptor is present. But when we do that in the CD4, in the CD4 positive T-cell, there's no CD8 co-receptor. And we all know that the CD8 co-receptor comes alongside the MHC molecule and TCR complex to provide some additional stability of the interaction. So as our product normally contains both CD4s and CD8s, we're looking at whether by co-expressing CD8 together with our T-cell receptor, we can improve the function of the CD4 part of the uh, product we would be putting into our patients. So there are a number of different ways that this might, func might function and might benefit our product. First of all, we could see that we might enhance the ability of the CD4 T-cells to recognise antigen and thereby proliferate. They may increase the amount of cytokines that they can produce to provide help, IL-2, etc. They may also increase different numbers of chemokines and cytokines that recruit other parts of the immune system too. They, they also may have, some, it may have some benefit on direct tumour cell killing as well. Normally that's the function of the CD8s mostly, but in this case we could be harnessing some uh, cytotoxic function of the, of the CD4s as well. But also the more broader aspect is that by upregulating CD40 ligand, we may be able to show, demonstrate enhanced um, interaction with dendritic cells, which may also be a beneficial property for epitope spreading. So I'm going to show you some data that we've generated as part of our collaboration with GSK. The, 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 the figure I want you to particularly focus on is the bottom right-hand side one, and this is looking at proliferation of CD4 T cells. And what we can see is that by co-expressing the CD8 co-receptor in, in the CD4 T cells along with our TCR, we're enhancing the proliferation capacity of our CD4 positive T cells in response to antigen. In the same way, the blue lines are our CD8 next generation product. This is done with the MYESO C259 TCR. And this is a dose titration of peptide across the bottom with the IL-2 response on the left-hand side. And so you can see that in two out of the three donors here, we've got a shift to the left in the curves of the blue lines, which indicates that the T cells, this is CD, purified CD4 T cells, um, are producing cytokines at a lower peptide concentration than they would typically in our standard assay setup. So we're seeing both enhanced proliferation, but also enhanced cytokine production when we co-express CD8 in our CD4 T cells. So this is, a, this is a, an, an incusite assay. Um, so to orient you, this is a, we put a, a fluorescent reagent into the, uh, into the assay. And as the cells undergo apoptosis, they turn green, essentially. So a good outcome when we see enhanced killing is that the, the curve on the left-hand side shifts up. So that's, kind of, that's, that's the incusite assay. It's a, it's a very useful technology for, for looking at um, cell lysis in, vivo, in vitro. So what we can see is, again, this is using purified CD4 T cells, uh, purified CD4 T cells, recognizing in Mueso. The red line is the cells ex which express just the TCR on, the own, on, on their own. You can see they do have some cytotoxic function against the antigen-positive tumor line that we put in the assay. But if we put the CD8 co-receptor in there as well, we can see that we get enhanced lysis of the antigen-positive targets in this case. And this is demonstrated across multiple donors on the, on the right-hand side. Finally, the, CD, the potential for interaction with dendritic cells. So what we're looking at here is the percentage of cells, <coughs> excuse me, the percentage of cells that express CD40 ligand. This is looking again at the CD4 com the compartment in particular. And the blue ones again are the uh, CD CD8 co the, the cells expressed in the CD8 co-receptor. And you can see that typically they have higher levels of CD40 ligand on their cell surface 
when they interact with antigens. So they upregulate the CD40 ligand, which gives them the potential to better interact with dendritic cells to potentially prime a more broad immune response. So what we've shown you today so far from this part of the story is that we can co-express the CD8 co-receptor in our product um, to enhance the efficacy, particularly of our CD4 T-cell component of our product. So we see enhanced T-cell proliferation, particularly of the CD4s. We see enhanced cytochrome production. We see an improved killing of antigen-positive targets by the CD4 compartment. And we also see increased CD40 ligand expression, suggesting it may be beneficial for interacting with DCs. And so we're suggesting that this co-expression of CD8 may improve the function of our product by both direct ways, such as the cytotoxicity and cytokine production, but also by potentially indirect effects, so causing epitope spreading and interaction with DCs. And as a little sort of spoiler alert, I've been allowed to present this. We've also got a post that's being presented at AACR um, in April, I think it is, which has been accepted, again, looking at... Uh, the co-expression of CD8 in one of our own um, in-house TCR products as well with the MAJ4 TCR. So that's some uh, data from that particular program. So just to switch gears again, now we're going to talk about an, a second next generation program that we're, we've been looking at, which is to co-express a dominant negative TGF-beta receptor within our product. This is a, a sort of cartoon showing some of the many different effects that TGF-beta can have on the immune system, both within the thymus and also within the periphery. But in general, the take-home message, as many of you probably know, is that TGF-beta is a, an immunoregulatory cytokine. It typically damps down immune responses, it inhibits T-cell proliferation, cytokine production, etc. It also has, um, enhances the activity and differentiation of regulatory T-cells as well. So as, far, and so as far as an immune response is concerned, at least in terms of an anti-tumor immune response, the high levels of TGF-beta may be a negative thing. So it has many different effects. It's produced by lots of different cell types, both by the tumours themselves, but also by other tumour-associated cells, such as regulatory T cells that are recruited into the local environment. Um, typically it inhibits proliferation, differentiation, T cell cytotoxicity. It also induces apoptosis in uh, of T cells as well. So what we've tried to do here is to say, can we interfere with TGF-beta signalling in T cells, such that we make them resistant to this otherwise inhibitory signal? And this is some data from, uh, that our colleagues in GSK provided us with. It's from the TGCA data sets. And what it is, it's looking at a panel of TGF-beta associated genes in a number of different indica cancer indications. So red is upregulated, green is downregulated. And what this, this shows us is that in many different tumor indications, there are high levels of TGF-beta. TGF-beta is one of those lines that I'm not going to point out which one it is, but it's one of the TGF beta is one of those lines, so showing that TGF beta is commonly upregulated in a lot of different cancer indications. But the, the other part the other 60 or so genes within that um, gene subset are all TGF beta associated genes. So this suggests that not only is TGF beta present, but it's also active in inducing uh, TGF beta signaling. So this is suggesting that the TGF-beta pathway is commonly upregulated and also active within various tumour indications. So potentially a, an interesting target for enhancing immunotherapy. So what we've used, this is a, a, um, an approach that was taken from a paper a number of years ago. And it's essentially to, to truncate or cut off the signalling domain of the TGF-beta receptor. The TGF-beta receptor 2 is a um, homodimer, uh, binds the TG, TGF-beta receptor 2 and TGF-beta receptor 1 bind to TGF-beta um, and dimerize, and you then get um, signaling, phosphorylation and signaling within inside the cell. So if we cleave off the, um, the phosphorylation domain inside, we essentially remove the ability of the TGF-beta receptor to, do, to undergo signaling in response to TGF-beta binding. And so that's what we're looking at here. Here we're looking at um, phosphosmad signaling. Phosphosmad is one of the downstream um, Signaling, one of the downstream parts of the signaling pathway that is respo in response to TGF-beta signaling. And what we can see on the bottom particularly, we've got um, the open histograms are untreated T-cells, and the, the, the pink histograms are the ones where you have TGF-beta present. And what you can see is that with the non-transduced cells on the left-hand side, when you put TGF-beta, you get upregulation of phosphosmad signaling. In the middle, the same when you've got our transduced T-cells expressing the MYESO TCR. But on the right-hand side, we can see if we express, co-express this dominant negative receptor together with our TCR, we don't have this upregulation of phosphosmad signaling in, in response to TGF-beta. 
This has functional effects as well. Again, we're looking here at uh, VPD. This is a, a, a VPD dye that undergoes division similar to CFSC. And what we can see is that we have decreased proliferation of our T cells if you put TGF beta into the assay. But if you co express the dominant negative TGF beta in that, kind of, in that kind of context, we can at least recover some or most of the T cell proliferation that would otherwise be inhibited by the presence of TGF beta. We see a very similar kind of thing in the context of cytokine production as well. Um, focus on the, the red lines are the, 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 our, st our standard T cells, the MYESO specific T cells without the, without the dominant negative TGF beta. And you can see that cytokine production is dramatically reduced in response to antigen when you have high levels of TGF beta present. However, if you look at the blue dots or the blue lines across the bottom, you can see that the cells that express the dominant negative TGF beta receptor together with our TCR show a, at least a partial or in some cases a complete resistance to inhibition by TGF beta, suggesting that some, another one of their key functions is, is still maintained in the presence of otherwise inhibitory concentrations of TGF. Now, I'm really hoping this works. Um, <laughs> On, on the, at the top panel, again, this is the Incusite assay that we're showing you previously. Um, so in, uh, on the left-hand side, you've got T-cell uh, killing of tumor, uh, tumor targets, the red being the MYESO TCR on its own. On the left-hand side, you've got no TGF beta present, so both T-cells are pretty, pretty functional. On the right-hand, uh, in the middle graph, you can see when you put the TGF beta in, the red, the red curve shifts dramatically to the left, up uh, to the right, sorry, which indicates there is a reduction in cytotoxic capacity of the T cells in the presence of TGF beta. What you also notice is that the, the blue curve is nowhere near as much shifted, which suggests that the dominant negative TG, TGF beta receptor expression is conferring resistance to TGF. Now I'm going to show you, hopefully show you if it works and. Uh, these are, these, these are uh, 3D killing assays, which are done, again done in the ink site, um, but using GFP labeled targets. It is working, hooray. Okay, so on the, right, on the, the far left hand side, you've got the steroids being completely eradicated in the absence of TGF beta. Um, and that's irrespective of whether they express the TGF beta receptor or not. On the, in the middle, on the right hand side, what you can see is that the, the cells that have the MYESO TCR at the top are inhibited and they don't eradicate the spheroids over the, the time course of this experiment. This is about five or six days. Whereas the cells at the bottom um, have, have virtually completely eradicated the spheroid, or at least they're much more potent in the presence of TGF beta compared to the ones that don't express the dominant negative receptor. So what we'd like to suggest is that the TGF beta um, is a common pathway that seems to be upregulated in lots of different cancer indications. It may be a pathway that we want to try and overcome. Um, we've shown you that we can express the dominant negative receptor in our cells, and that confers at least partial and in some cases complete resistance to inhibition by TGF, both in terms of proliferation, cytotoxicity and cytokine production. Um, and we're, you know, studies are ongoing to look at patient tumour signatures to see whether this might be a, a useful pathway to target in our indications of interest. So I'd just like to finish off by saying thank you to a large number of people that have been involved with this work. Um, so we've got some fantastic collaborators with our colleagues over at GSK who we've worked with for a number of years on this programme. And then the, the various folks that have been involved in this project at Daptomy, both from the cell research group, which is my team, and the um, preclinical team are also represented on these, these projects. So I'd like to say thank you for your attention, and I'll take a couple of questions. Thank you.